Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Good Wednesday, isn't it? Let me know in the chat how you're doing. Oh, well. So, are you excited about doing some C programming? Today is the day when we finally get to do some of our own actual writing programs, compiling them and running them. Tell me about how your semester has gone so far. Did you get all your classes? If you're taking classes that are actually in the classroom, did you find them okay? Did you get to meet your instructors, meet some of your classmates? Oh, it's a hard crowd today. Oh, Steve says this is his only class this semester. Well, that's a nice light load. Are you uh, just finishing up? Or just taking it one at a time? Uh, yeah, just got a few more classes to do, huh? Well, good, I hope you get all done. Hope you get everything finished. All right. Well, why don't we just dive right into it? Now, when we left off last time, we were talking about just the kind of the basics of the C language. And we gone over some of the basic data types in C and how they differ from Java. Why don't we review those? And then we'll talk about things like the structure of programs and how to write some of your first programs. Okay, so in the C language, well, first of all, C pretty much predates all this object-oriented stuff that we've done since the 1980s. So the C language itself has no concept of things like public and private. There's only just functions and variables and then the stuff inside the functions, and that's it. So it's kind of like you're removing one extra layer of stuff in order to get to your program. So there's no public and private, there's no class definitions, no interfaces, uh, none of that stuff that you would normally associate with being uh, with, with the language like Java. Um, that being said, without something like classes and objects, you don't you no longer have a hierarchy of classes and so it means that your function names have to be unique across your entire project. Whereas in Java, because you have a class hierarchy, you can have a method named like um, toString in one uh, class, and you can have a method named toString in another class, and they don't collide with one another. But in C, because you don't have a hierarchy, everything is flat. It's a flat namespace. All your functions have to have unique names. And this can create a problem if, as your projects get bigger and bigger because it means that, uh, especially if you're working with a team of people and they're working with other teams of people, uh, means one team would have to collaborate with the other team to make sure that all their function names are unique across the entire project. Another big difference is that variable and functions must be declared before they are used. And that means declared as in declared up above in your source file. So as you're going down through the source file, you must find the declarations for functions and variables before you call them and before you use them. 
in Java, you don't have to do that. You can declare a method down below where you actually call it. But in C, it has to be top to bottom, declarations first, and then uses. And the reason for that is that C historically has been what's called a one-pass compiler. The compiler reads in your source code file and then starts at the top and makes one pass through the source code, translating it into the equivalent assembly language instructions as it goes. A programming language like Java has historically been a two-pass compiler. It makes one pass through your source code to learn all the names of things, and then it makes another pass through to do the actual translation. But because it already knows the names of things, when it sees the name of a method being called that, it hasn't, that hasn't been declared yet, it knows that that method exists, and it's able to then translate that into the assembly language instructions. So this has a, um, an effect on the way you write your program. It has to be written in such a way that the methods, uh, functions, and variables are declared before they're used. Now, you may not want to actually structure it that way. A lot of people like doing what's called top-down programming, uh, in which like the main is at the top, and the smaller auxiliary functions are towards the bottom of the file. <clears throat> there are ways to do what are called forward declarations in C, where you can say, well, I'm going to be using a function called print, let's say, um, in this file. I'm not going to define it yet, but I'll at least tell the compiler about its existence. And there's ways to do that. So let's go over this list of variable types like int and float and double. I've written down here some of them under the Java column. I want you to tell me what's the equivalent that you would use in C. So for int in Java, what's the closest thing that you would use in C in order to accomplish the same thing? Uh, Steve says int, that's good. With the caveat, that in Java, an int is defined to be a 32-bit quantity, and in C, it's going to be de processor-dependent. Most likely, on a modern processor, int is going to be the one that you want. How about for float? In Java, you would write float. What would you write for C? Yep, that's also float. Good. And for double. Also double. Same thing. Boolean. In Java, you got Boolean. What do you have for C? You don't have no Boolean type, at least not in the standard C language. There is a, um, there's like an auxiliary file you can bring into your program that will define what looks like a Boolean, but behind the scenes it's just actually an int or a character. So that gives you the ability to use the word Boolean, but really it's just an alias for int. In Java, the character data type is a variable size. It could be anywhere from one byte up to four, five, or six bytes, depending upon what character you're encoding. Uh, what's the equivalent in C? C doesn't have an equivalent. Steve is correct. Um, no equivalent. Java has the byte data type, which is exactly one character, ex uh, so not, uh, exactly one byte, obviously, eight bits. Uh, what would be the equivalent C data type? Character. Mm -hmm. 
And then finally, string. In Java, you got a string data type. What will be the equivalent C data type? Well, you're right. C doesn't have strings directly. But what could you use instead? Yep, character array. So you could use character star, or what's the other way of writing that? Yeah, or character bracket bracket. Good. Okay, there are a few other data types, but these are the important ones, at least for now. Um, a little bit about writing string literals. A string literal is like... Um, you know, actually a string in your program. In, uh, uh, it's done basically the same way it's done in Java, which is with double quotes. If you use single quotes, that's just a single character. So double quotes in C is a, is a string, an array of characters. And single quotes is just a single character. If you attempt to put a string inside of single quotes, you'll get an error from the compiler. Okay, so this applies to writing strings or characters actually in your program itself. Okay, another big difference is that in C, variables don't get a default value. If I was to declare a variable, if I would say int x, semicolon, and then print out the value of x or use x in a calculation, um, I would get essentially uh, what, what I call a garbage value. Right? The, the value of x is not defined to be anything. In reality, <clears throat> the value of x is going to be whatever was in the memory before your program ran. So, so some other program ran in the past, and then your program comes along and is loaded into memory. Your program declares a variable called x, and the, the computer that sets aside 32 bits or 4 bytes for the value of x, and then whatever is in those 4 bytes happens to be the value of x. In Java, the value of x will be uh, defined for you. It'll initialize the variable x to be the value 0, or for a Boolean, it'll be the value false. Or for objects, it'll be the value null. But in C, they do not get a default value. It's up to you, the programmer, to initialize them. So if you want to initialize x to be 0, you would do it like this. You could do int x semicolon and then x equals 0. Or you could just do int x equals 0. But you may not need to initialize it at all if in the very next statement or statements you're going to be assigning to the value of x, let's say, the result of a computation. Now, there you might not need to initialize it. So C leaves it up to you, the programmer, to initialize the variable if you need to. If you don't need to initialize it, then you don't have to bother. And the reason why this, this is there is, again, historical. When C first came out in the early 1970s, computers were a lot slower, had a lot less memory than they do now. And so a decision was made to leave it up to the programmer about whether they want to expend the precious computer cycles 
initializing a variable if you were just going to assign to it later on. If you were going to assign to it in the very next statement, why bother initializing it? It's just extra work for the computer to do. I think these days, uh, most programming languages choose to initialize variables because it's safer that way, right? The, the programmer is not going to be surprised by uh, some unknown value involved in a computation. Um, compilers these days are smart enough, since there are like two pass compilers and it can actually look ahead in your program. Um, most compilers these days, if you initialize the variable, if you said like int x equals zero, and then in a subsequent statement you said like x equals five, then the compiler would just ignore that first initialization. It wouldn't assign x to be zero. It would just skip that and then go on and assign it, assign it to be five. So compilers these days are pretty good about um, avoiding excess computations it doesn't need to do. But C has been around a very long time, and so a lot of these um, ways that it do things have sort of just been encapsulated in the language, and, it's, and there's been a lot of resistance to change these sorts of things. Sure, we, we could redefine C so that it just initializes variables if it needs to, or if the programmer didn't do it. Um, however, uh, I think the people who are in charge of the C language and defining its evolution over time have said, Let, let's, let's make C be a language that remains stable and doesn't change a whole lot over time. Other languages like Python and Java, they can change all the time. But our kind of philosophy, I'm speaking for them, is, is to make a language that is stable, that people can rely on for years to come, and that its behavior doesn't change a whole lot. Um, that says it, it has evolved over time to kind of keep up with some more modern language design aspects, but overall it's remained pretty much the same, especially since about the 90s or so. The uh, operators in C are almost identical to those in Java. You've got arithmetic operators, modulo or remainder operator. You got the increment and decrement operators, just like they are in Java. Assignment. The uh, Boolean conditional operators, like and, or, not, equals, those are all exactly the same. The array operator. <clears throat> um, it also has bitwise operators for manipulating individual bits of a number. Java has those too. You may not have used them, but uh, they actually come from C. C being a language that is really tied into doing things like, um, uh, basically C was designed to be a replacement for assembly language. And so a lot of the things that assembly language programmers needed to do, C can do as well. So uh, manipulating the individual bits within a, uh, a memory location is something that assembly language programmers do all the time. And so C provides the operators for doing that. This one is called the, the AND operator. Um, it's for doing AND operations between two or more bits. This is the OR operator. And these are the SHIFT operators that can move bits left or right within, um, within a, a variable. The uh, flow control um, keywords are pretty much the same. You've got IF and then a condition inside the parentheses. You've got WHILE and a condition. You've got DO WHILE. These are all exactly the same as in Java. You know, no surprise, Java got all this stuff from C. Um, Java has two kinds of for loops. The classic kind with the initialization, condition, and increment with semicolon separating the pieces. And it's got like a, a newer kind that was added later on. But C only has the classic kind. C also has switch statements, just like Java. Um, but however, the, the switch statements work on numbers or characters only. They don't work on strings like they do in Java. That was added on fairly recently in Java to have switch statements work on strings. But uh, C only works on numbers or things that are equivalent to numbers like characters. I guess in other words, switch statements only work on the primitive data types like int, um, character, uh, long, short, float, double, those sorts of things.
Uh, do you have any questions for me at this point? Um, there's a question here. What do they mean when they say C is closer to the hardware? That's a good question. <clears throat> um, so like I said, back in the 1970s, a lot of programming was done in assembly language. So if you wanted to eke out as much performance as you could on some of these slower pieces of hardware that existed back in the day, um, you did your work in assembly language. And so, uh, and if you wanted to write something like an operating system or um, you know, a database, you would do that all in assembly language because you needed to have access to the underlying hardware. You need to have access to things like memory locations directly. Because one of the things the operating system does is like load programs from a storage device into the computer's memory. So you need a way to be able to pull individual characters out of a file and stick them into individual bytes in a computer's hardware. Assembly language is perfect for that because it has instructions for doing exactly that. Uh, so the designers of the C language wanted to make something that would be relatively high performance like assembly language and give C programmers the same kinds of um, hardware access that assembly language had. So it has operators for dealing with memory locations and shifting bits around and, and um, um, accessing the computer's hardware the same way that assembly language allows you to access it. So although assembly language gives you access to things like registers, which C doesn't give you direct access to the registers, it does have ways of giving hints to the compiler like put this variable in a register, don't put it in memory because I want just leave it there. And you can actually embed assembly language instructions in C programs. You can, there's a keyword called ASM. You just say ASM, and then inside your curly braces, you put assembly language instructions. And the compiler will just drop those assembly language instructions right into your program, right into the compiled output. The very first C compilers were pretty much just one-to-one -one translators of the C code into assembly language instructions. If you saw uh, a statement like, x equals 2 plus 3, it would literally take the number 2 and put it into a register, and the number 3 and put it into a register, add those two things together, and then store it in the memory location corresponding to x. It really just went down your program one line at a time and turned them into equivalent assembly language instructions. Languages like Java, although they look a lot like C, are actually separated quite a bit from the underlying hardware. In Java, the, um, although the statements look like C, it's running on a virtual machine. It's running on a program that simulates the hardware of kind of a generic computer. And the actual computer it's running on doesn't matter. It could be an Intel computer, it could be an ARM computer, it could be a, um, one of the old you know, 8-bit processors. It doesn't matter. Um, the Java virtual machine ensures that the Java programs see a simulated hardware that's the same across all platforms. And then there are other languages like Python and Perl and um, you know SQL, which is a specialized language just for doing databases. Those are even further divorced from the hardware. You don't have to know pretty much anything about the actual underlying hardware at all to be able to use languages like those. And so they provide constructs for doing higher level operations. You know, SQL in particular is a good example of that. You do operations to manipulate tables of data. How those tables are actually stored in the computer doesn't matter to you as an SQL programmer. So last time we introduced you to a function called printf, which was used for printing things out on the screen. And I briefly showed that there were basically two ways to use this function. The first is to provide just simply just a string, just a string. So you just put in double quotes the thing that you want to print out on the, on the screen, um, and that's it. And the other way was to treat that string as kind of like a template for how you want the output to appear on the screen. So it, within that first string, you put any words that you want to appear on the screen, but you also put these placeholders in, these, uh, these uh, percent symbols, and then the program will go through your string, 
find every single one of those percent signs and swap in the value of the corresponding variable in the list that follows the formatting string. So here I've got two format placeholders and the percent %s here will take the value of the first variable, which is name, and the percent %d will take the value of the second one, which is age. So it just goes down the line and pulls them in one at a time in, from the corresponding locations. So we've already seen one of these format specifiers, that's percent %d, and that stands for decimal or base 10 integer. And there's percent %s, which stands for string. There's actually about a dozen or so of them, but there's a, uh, maybe four that are important at this point. Four or five that are important at this point. Percent %c, which is a single character. Percent %f, which is used for floats. And for doubles, you don't use percent %d, because that's already being used for integers. You use percent %lf, long float. In the first versions of C, you didn't actually have a double data type. You had float and you had long float. And there are ways to manipulate the way the, the numbers actually get formatted on the screen. Like if you want to take a floating point number and have only two decimal places shown on the screen, like if you have a money amount, and you do a calculation and it results in you know, um, parts of a penny, you can round it to two decimal places like this. You can say percent point two F. And that tells it to display a float, but have two decimal places after the decimal point. Same thing goes for the doubles. You can say 0.2 LF, and it will round a double to two decimal places. Um, can I dif differentiate between floats and doubles? Sure. So it, it, it basically has to do with the precision of the numbers. A float is stored, I think, in a 32-bit uh, quantity and some of those bits are set aside for the exponent and some of those bits are set aside for the decimal places. So you've got 32 bits and you have to divide them up amongst those two things. And then for a double, I think that's sorted in a 64-bit quantity and so there is a lot more bits that you can use for the decimal places and for the exponent. And so the double is, uh, can represent a much wider range of numbers than a float can but it uses up twice as much space. Um, that being said, these days, on many modern processors, the double is actually the more, uh, more efficient one because the floating point units, the floating point computation units in the CPU have been designed to use doubles by default. Floats are kind of like uh, an exception. That's particularly, tr um, I was gonna say, no, I was gonna say something that wasn't true. Um, so most of the time, you'll probably want to use doubles. I, I still use floats, though, because when I do a computation, and I, I don't need to see, like, 20 decimal places after my answer. If, if I'm doing, like, money computations, a float is going to be fine, particularly for the kinds of programs we're going to write. Um, GPUs these days, however, um, because you're interested more in speed rather than precision, uh, for GPUs, a float tends to be the more uh, convenient data type to use because GPUs need to do like really fast computations. So the fewer bits you're doing computations to, the faster it goes. And so floats tend to, it tends to be optimized for floats rather than doubles.
Let's talk a little bit about input with scanf. And this is actually probably the more tricky one to get used to. It, it's still structured the same way as printf. You still have a format string in the beginning and then variables to put the values into after the format string. Uh, but there's some like key things you need to know about scanf. First thing is that format string that you that you put at the beginning of the function call really is again a template. Scanf's job is to try to match that template against what the user typed in. So if the template says percent %d, it means it's expecting the user to type in a base 10 integer quantity. And if it doesn't encounter that, <clears throat> if that's not like the first thing it sees, if it sees a word, then it goes, oh, I'm done. I give up. It's really kind of brittle in that case. It's very easy to, to break. It's very unforgiving about what it is looking for and what it's trying to match against. So if the template is not matched, scanf gives up and doesn't assign to any remaining variables. And I said that kind of carefully, because let's say your scanf is expecting two variables to be typed in. Let's say it expects um, um, an integer and then a character. Or, or let's say, now nah, let's not do an integer character. Let's do like uh, an integer <clears throat> followed by a comma and then followed by another integer. So we expect the user to type in a number and then a comma and then another number. And if, they, if the user just types in two numbers without that comma in between, scanf will read in the first one because it saw the first one. And then it says, okay, I'm expecting a comma, but I don't see one here, so I give up. The first variable has its value from the user uh, from the user input, but the second variable remains uninitialized and unchanged. So you can run into some surprises there, like why are some of my variables getting values and other ones not? So let me let me write out what that example would look like. Percent D, comma. D. And let's say we want to put into the x variable and the y variable. Okay, so we expect the user to type in a number and then a comma and then another number. And so if the user matches that template, then the first number will go into x and the second number will go into y. Now, what if I do something like this? What if I do scanf percent %d percent %d and then x and y? So here I've, I've butted up the two number specifications together. How do I separate them? How does, how does scanf know when one number ends and the next one begins? Well, um, it, uh, what scanf is going to do is it's going to expect there to be what's called white space in between the two numbers. White space is space or return or tab. Use white space to separate the inputs. Basically, scanf will ignore any spaces that you type in to your input. So if it encounters a space, it'll just simply kind of roll past them and then look for the next characters. White space is space, tab, or enter or return. I mean, this all seems a little esoteric and kind of Strange, but you have to remember that C dates back 
to the 1970s when the way we interacted with computers was much different than the way we interact now. Today we point and click and drag and um, we might type once in a while, but most of it's done with gestures. Um, but back then, most of the input was keyboard and screen, uh, text on the screen. And so the basic functions for doing input and output for C are really geared around that kind of interaction. How would you go about data validation? So yeah, like asking a user to <clears throat> enter a number <clears throat> and making sure that it doesn't break if they enter like a character. Oh, yeah, so like I said, Scanf is really brittle. That's a really good question. Um, I guess what I would do if, if I really wanted to do input validation like that is I would um, read the input into a string. So just suck in all the characters into a string. Um, and then you could use something like one of Scanf's cousins called S Scanf, which is for scanning through strings. And then you could attempt to do pattern matching against the user input. And you could look at the return value from Scanf and see whether it was successful or not. Does that make sense? Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so you pull all the input into a string, and then you essentially use Scanf, but not from the keyboard, from the string. And then you attempt to match your template against the user's input. And you can see the return value. Scanf will return a number to you that tells you how many inputs it was successfully uh, able to match. And if, uh, if you're expecting four inputs and you got back to number three, then you know it didn't match. And then you could go back and ask the user to type in it again. All right, thank you. <clears throat> you know, if you were doing, um, uh, writing a program in like Python or Perl or maybe even Java, you could do regular expression matching against the user's input. You learn about regular expressions in like your Linux class, or or if you take a, a class, or you learn about if you take a class in one of those other languages, or you take your Linux class, you'll learn about regular expressions, and those are great for doing pattern matching because you can now just look character at a time through the user's input and see if it matches what you're expecting. That's how I would approach it in another language. You can do regular expressions in C, but they're just horribly complicated because it just wasn't designed to do that sort of thing. So. Um, I would use something like Scanf or S, its cousin, S Scanf, to do that job. I, I drew up these these pictures here because someone always asks, like, how does this whole white space thing work? Um, so basically, if if you have a percent %d in your format code, uh, scan, Scanf really is is really kind of dumb. It's it's not that smart. All it does is that the reason why it's called scanf is because it's scanning through your input from left to right, from beginning to end, and then it's attempting to do this rudimentary pattern matching against what you typed in. And it just goes literally from left to right. So if you have percent %d as your format, what it does is it goes into this state machine, and as long as it sees white space, it just keeps looping. So as long as your input is like space, 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 it just keeps looping here. When it finally encounters a character that is part of a number, like a digit or a negative sign, then it pops over here to this other state. And then as long as it continues to see numbers, it loops here. And then finally, when it sees anything else other than number, it's done, and it, now it assigns to the variable. Okay, so this is, this is a rudimentary like input validation for a single number. Now, if you put a space into the format code, then you're basically telling Scanf, um, just uh, absorb any white space that the user might type in. So as long as they are typing in white space, like spaces, tabs, returns, it just keeps looping here. And then finally, when it encounters something else, like a character, it's done. Okay, so if you have a format specifier that includes a comma in between the two numbers, then the user must type in the comma. It's going to say, uh, the user has to type in a, a digit, or a, not a digit, a number, which means it's going to use this state machine. Then it's going to expect to see a comma. Then it goes back and does this thing again. Uh, what if Scanf encounters multiple white space separated inputs, but it's only expecting to see one? Like if, if the format specifier is a percent %d, 
but the user types in two numbers. Well, in that case, something strange happens. Um, the, the program will put the first number into the variable that you've got listed there, and then it will just stop. Because your format specifier didn't tell it to do anything else. It just stops at that point. Um, and so the remaining inputs stay out there <laughs> to be read in the next time you call scanf. I mean, this, this goes back to, uh, here's a picture that I usually draw. Here, here's your program. And let's say you're calling scanf. Um, there is this kind of like amorphous thing out there called standard input, which by default is connected to your keyboard. And it's also got this thing called standard output, which by default is connected to your screen. But you've learned in uh, a command line class, if you have experience with the command line, with the Linux command line, you know that you can redirect these things from other places, like standard input could come from a file or it could come from the network. And standard output could go to a file, or it could go to the network, or go to a printer, or you know any other device that, that is attached to the computer that is an output device. <clears throat> so you can kind of picture this standard input not as a cloud, like I've drawn here, but more like a, um, I guess, kind of like a, a, a barrel full of water. And the water represents the data that's coming in from these input devices like the keyboard. And so when scanf goes to uh, scan through your input, it's basically asking for one character at a time out of this barrel. So there's a kind of like a faucet attached here. And when it scans through your input, it asks for one little drop of character out of that, that barrel. Right? And then it, then it goes to that state machine and it's trying to verify, is this character what I'm expecting to see or is it not? And then if it is, it then moves on to the next drop of water and then the next drop of water. But as soon as it's done, as soon as it has worked its way through that format string, um, it's no longer going to turn that faucet on. So there may still be data sitting in that barrel waiting to be read in, but it's still out there. So when does it get read in? Well, the next time you call scanf, it starts opening up that faucet again. And then the, those, those characters start dripping in. Well, the characters that are going to drip in are the ones from before, the ones that are still waiting to be read in. So that's why I say about scanf being kind of brittle, right? It, it, it's easy to, to break the way it works. What would you do in that case? Like if, if uh, the user had typed in two numbers, you only expected one, well, how do you get that other number out of there? Um, there are some functions you can call that basically will flush that barrel out. You turn on the faucet and just flush the data out, let it just drain away, and then you can start anew again. But I don't want to complicate things too much at this point. I want to keep things fairly simple. We're not going to do a whole lot with input validation. What we're mostly focused on is getting you to write your first programs and being successful at compiling and running them. Did that answer your question? Okay. So we're getting there. We're getting there really quickly here. About So we covered the basics of the, the C language. Um, the basic structure of a C program. At this point, they're all pretty much going to look the same. You're writing really small, short programs that do maybe just one or two things. So your programs are going to be short and simple. At the very top of the program, you're going to write this hash or pound include, and then in angle brackets, stdo.h. These lines that start with the hash symbol are called preprocessor 
directives. There could be more, and as we make more complicated programs, there will be more. And I'm not going to explain just yet what this line is. I want you to be successful at writing and compiling programs to begin with. And you might look at this and go, well, this is kind of like import. I know Java, so this is kind of like import. It looks kind of like import. It starts with an I. And I guess you can kind of think that they're kind of the same, but they're not really. But, but I guess at this point, it might be useful to think of it's kind of like import. In between the preprocessor directives and your function is where you would put things like global variables, global constants, and so forth. We're not really going to have any. I want you, when you're writing your programs, try to avoid using global variables as much as possible. It, it's, it's kind of difficult coming from a Java background to think about not using globals because Java really encourages you to use what look like globals. You, you start your class definition and then you write out your instance variables, which are kind of like globals, right? They're shared amongst all the different methods within a class. But in C, because we don't have classes, and we don't have that nice encapsulation of uh, variables within a class, when you declare global, it's global to your entire program, not just the functions that need it. And so you really want to flip things around and avoid using globals unless you've got a really good reason for making a variable that exists while you're, for the entire duration of your program. So avoid global variables for now. Global constants, however, you probably should use. Uh, so if you have things like um, loop limits, like you want to run from 0 to 10, but later on you might want to change that to 0 to 20, you could make that maximum number be a constant, and that'd be fine, right? Because constants don't really occupy a whole lot of memory in the, in the computer. But you want to avoid global variables at this point. Okay, and then you dive into your main, and declaring the main in, in C is really simple. It's just int main, and then two parentheses. Later on, we'll find out how that could be modified, but right now that's what it is. Then you've got your opening and closing curly braces, and inside the main you've got your statements. By this time next week, we're going to start learning about functions, and then you'll be breaking up your program into smaller pieces, and those all just go below the preprocessor directives and the globals. Okay, so let's get started writing our programs. So let me log into our class website first. Let's take a look at what we need to do. So you've probably already worked through the the um, you know the the beginning content here, and then you'll click over to modules. Hopefully, you've, by now you've seen a lot of these videos. Remember that by Friday, you should respond to these two discussions, and that by Monday, you should respond to at least two of your classmates. And I actually want to encourage you to kind of keep the discussion going, so after you've responded to two of your classmates, check back a day later and see if they've responded to you, and then you could, maybe they've asked you some questions, and so you might want to just keep things going. Okay, so we're basically down to here. So I've got a video about how to type in a very simple program that just says, hello, C. And these sort of programs are actually useful. You know, it may seem like, uh, why, why are we writing a little program that just says one thing? Well, it does help build confidence that we're able to do a couple of things, that we're able to type in a program and save it, that we're able to compile that program. 
and that we're able to run that program and get the results that we expected. And that lets us know that things like our editor is working, our compiler is working, our, our runtime environment is working. Without those things, all other programs are going to be impossible. So we often start out with a very simple program that just lets us know that all the pieces are in place so that we can write more complex programs. So let's try it out. So we're using a web-based development environment. It's basically just a Linux virtual machine on which has been layered an editor and a compiler and a command line that you can interact with. So ours is called Theia. Now those of you who are not in this course and are watching elsewhere, um, you will not have access to this because this is just for our class. However, there are uh, plenty of resources out there that will, will probably work for you, like there's a Repolit, which gives you free little virtual machines and an editor and a compiler that you can use. Um, there's Visual Studio Code that you can run on your computer, as long as you've got a compiler or a command line environment installed that it, that it can get access to, then that'll work. So there's a bunch of things that you could do, but I'm providing this web-based environment because there's nothing to install, nothing to maintain. All the files that we need are right here at, a, at where we can use them, and everyone's looking at the same thing. So when I show you an example, you can follow along and see the exact same thing. Now, if you launch this and you don't get the spinning uh, cursor right away, but instead you get an error message that says, bad gateway, all that means, and this is something that, now I, I and some students developed this. We didn't develop the, the Thea environment, but we developed all the stuff around it, like the authentication and launching workspaces and um, uh, you know version, version control when new versions of Thea come out. That, that's what the students and I did. But um, so the backend programming is something that we're still working on. If you don't, if you get an error message that says "bad gateway," all it means is that when the the launcher was is kicking you over to use your virtual machine, the virtual machine wasn't quite ready yet. It just took a little bit longer to launch than it expected. Uh, all you have to do then is just close the tab, click on launch again, and then you should be good to go. Um, so here we are. Here are some of the programs we wrote last time, but let's go ahead and write this hello program. So it says, open a new editor tab, select new file from the file menu. So we go file, new file, and then we're going to type in the name of a file here. All the C files you're, you're writing have to end with a .c extension. Let's flip back to the instructions. Uh, you'll be prompted to enter a file name. We just did that. And then in the editor, editor pane, type the following C program. You can copy and paste it, but I would suggest go ahead and type it in, and that way you'll get a better feel for how the editor is going to be working. So remember we start out with the pound include stdo.h, then int main. You'll see these pop-ups that are happening as I type. The editor is giving us some auto-completion uh, hints about what we could type. I personally find them kind of annoying because I know what I'm typing in and it's not often what the editor wants to include. So I'm going to go and I'm going to turn those off. Let's see. Auto, auto indent. I like auto indent. I just don't want that auto complete. Suggest on trigger characters. I'm gonna take that out. Save my preferences, and now those pops pop ups should stop. Okay, printf hello C, and that's it. Save this program. Select Save from the File menu or use the corresponding keyboard shortcut. All right, so File, Save, or you'll notice next to that menu is Command S or Control S, depending upon your operating system. Double check that the hello C file has appeared in the file browser. So it should be over here. Very good. 
Go down to the terminal pane, and if there's not already one there, you can open one up by pulling down the terminal menu and selecting new terminal. So if we did not see a terminal pane down here, then we would go terminal, new terminal, and then one should appear. I've actually got two. I don't know why I've got two. So I'll close the one I don't need. Okay, compile this hello.c program with the following command and press enter. Clang hello.c. Or you could use GCC if you want. Now, if all goes well, you won't get any fanfare, you won't get any congratulations, you've compiled your program. It just simply will give you the prompt back, letting you know that it's finished. Um, if you're making errors as you're typing, you can use the delete or backspace keys on your keyboard, along with the left and right arrows. Since this is a keyboard-based command line, you can't use your mouse to make corrections. Um, you also can't use the up and down arrow keys uh, in, in a way that you expect. So if, I was to, if I'm typing this in and I make some kind of mistake, then I can use the left and right arrow keys to move around. I can use delete. And then to put in the correct character, you just type in the correct character. And then when you're done, you actually don't need to move to the end of the line at all. You can just press enter. Any, wherever the cursor is on the line, you can just press enter and it will accept that command. And then finally, if all went well, we'll get the prompt back with no fanfare. Uh, no news is good news. If you get some errors, see down below for help. Run the executable by typing this command, dot slash a dot out. And if all goes well, we see our program. We see the output from our program. Okay, help, something went wrong. Well, not a whole lot could go wrong. I guess, you know, you might skip a quote mark and then the compiler will tell you you're missing a quote. You might um, maybe missing a parentheses and then the compiler should let you know. I guess the, the biggest thing that might go wrong is maybe you misspelled main. Maybe you called it M-I-A-N. So there you get kind of a strange error message. Uh, it says undefined reference to main. And you might go, well, I have one here. Oh, I see. So this is what's called a linker error. We'll get into what those are a little bit later. But basically, it's, meaning, it's telling you, you're missing a main. It tried to look for one, didn't find one. Okay. Another reason why you might get this error message is because you didn't save the program. You didn't save your file. And so when the compiler went to go uh, compile it, it actually was looking at a blank file. And you'll get that message as well. Okay, so that's the hello program. Let's go through uh, what you need to actually write. There's one, two, three, four programs to write this week. They're all pretty short. And there's also a practice program. Let's look at the practice first. So this one is drag and drop these mixed up lines of code into a working program. The program should prompt the user for the height and width of a rectangle in that order. Calculate the area and display the result. Use correct indentation when doing this problem. That is, the lines between braces should be indented. Check your answer by clicking on Get Feedback. Okay, let's try it out. So here are all the lines. We're going to drag and drop lines into this yellow area. Which one should go first? Take a look at these 10 or so lines. Which one should I drag up there first? The include line, good.
Now normally we would put a blank space in between the include and the rest of the program just to make it visually look better and separate out the uh, parts of the program. But this little drag and drop thing doesn't have a way for me to just leave a blank line. So here we're not going to put one in, but you should put one in when you're writing your program. So what will go next? The main. So in main goes here. And then the curly brace. And then the next thing we need to do is prompt the user to enter the height and width in that order. So which, which of these printfs would go next? There's three of them. The first one, it says here, prompt for the height first, then the width. Oh, do we need to declare the variables first? You know, that's probably a good idea. We should probably declare the variables first. So let's put those in. Now this needs to be indented. So we're going to bring it over here. And then, since we are prompting for the height first, we should use this one. Then we are going to scan the input from the user. So there's two scan Fs, this one and this one. Which one do we do next? Probably this one. Height, yep. And then there's not much remaining. We're going to then prompt for the width. Get the input. Then we'll do the calculation. Print out the result and then close off the whole program. And then click on Get Feedback and all turn green. And so that's good. There are two kinds of problems that I'm going to give you. There's warm-up problems and level-up programs. Warm-up problems are going to be like... Whoops. Uh, you're looking at the wrong screen. Let me see. Warm-up problems are going to be short, usually 10 to 20 lines, pretty short programs, really to just exercise a particular concept. Level up programs are going to be larger programs that kind of put all those concepts together. So do the warm up programs first. Again, they're not going to be really long. They're going to be short, easy to do. Um, get them done. They just exercise one particular concept or two particular concepts. And then when you finally get to the level up, that's when you put everything together to make a slightly larger program. Still, at this point, they're going to be pretty small, but that's how the, the programs are going to work throughout this semester. So we got warm-up number one. It's called area. And this one is pretty much the same as what we just did with the practice, but this time we're going to allow the user to type in both the height and the width on the same line rather than doing it separately. I actually, for this particular program, don't care which way you do it, but the whole point is really just to get a, a, you know, a program up and running. So we're going to type in that program then calculate the area, uh, have the program calculate the area and display the result. So let's create a new file. Let's call it area.c. And we could actually really just copy and paste what we did in our practice. But let's, let's type it in from scratch. So we go int height width area. 
And then let's prompt the user. Let's see what it looks like here. Enter the height width of a rectangle. So what would I use as the scanf format code to allow the user to type in both numbers at the same time, rather than prompting for them separately? What would I put inside these quote marks? Percent %d, percent %d, very good. And then comma, ampersand height, and then ampersand width. Calculate the area by multiplying them together, and then print out the result. The area is percent %d. Uh, what do we type in? Square inches. All right, let's save that, compile it. So enter the height and width of a rectangle. Let's do uh, 5 and 12. And it says the area is 60 square inches. So now, again, we're not doing any error checking. So if we type in negative 5 and 12, the program will happily calculate that the area is negative. Don't worry about that. Let's see what happens if we type in an input that the computer is not expecting. Like, let's put in, let's put in um, Yahoo, like that. Well, we get zero. Let's put in five and then hello. Well, we also get zero. Let's put in hello and then five. And we still get zero. So it's, it's looking to us like if we, if we put in an input that's not expecting, we just get zero as the result. Let's put in, ah, oh, see, what, what could we put in the, oh, how about let's put in 5.9 5, 5 .9 and 12.8. Well, we still get zero. Notice we're not getting error messages. We're just getting zero as the answer. What if we put in eight and then press enter? Why is it just sitting there? Isn't it waiting for another variable? Yeah, it's waiting for another one. So our format specifier said, we're expecting two numbers to be inputted. He only typed in one. Uh, why is it stopping? Well, the answer is, remember, it ignores white space. So I press the Enter key. That's a white space character. So the computer's sitting there going, OK, you know, you can press Enter all you want. As soon as you type in the next number, then it will accept that as the input. So earlier I said, uh, if, you, if, you, if you're expecting two, but the user only types in one, that scanf would just abort. But actually what happens is, since enter is considered a white space character, it's just going to sit there and wait for you to type in your remaining input. Now, if we type in one single input and then like something it didn't expect, then it just aborted at that point. As soon as it saw that H, it went, oh, that's not part of a number. I'm just going to give up at that point. And now you get zero as the answer. So you know what I'm going to do, just as kind of an experiment, is I'm going to print out the value of height and width separately before we do the calculation. Save it, compile it, 
let's run it. So let's put in uh, 5 and 12, and you get 5 and 12 like you'd expect right here. Let's put in 5 and hello. So here we see that 5 went into height, but nothing went into width. So 5 did get assigned to height uh, right here. But as soon as it saw the hello, it just gave up at that point and left width untouched. A question came up, what if we put a comma in here? Now the comma is expected. The user must type in a comma in order for it to work. If I leave it out, then the 5 gets assigned, but the width does not, because it was expecting a comma, and I did not type a comma. So the pattern wasn't matched. It got as far as the 5, and then it stopped. Can you put white space before and after the comma? Oh, let's try that. 5 space comma space 12. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try some variations on that. Let's do 5 comma space 12. That did work. And then finally, let's do 5 space comma 12. And that did not work. So out of those kind of three variations, space before, space after, or both space before and after, the only one that actually works is the one with the space after. And the reason for that is our format specifier says there must be a comma in between these two numbers. But remember from that state diagram I showed you, let's see, where is it? Here it is, that when you see a format specifier, you're going to first ignore white space. So any white space that appears before that number is just going to be thrown away. And so that's what's happening here, is the, uh, the scanf here finds the first number, and stores it away in the variable, then it says, okay, the next character after the number must be a comma. And in fact, it is. It is a comma. It's right there. And then it says, okay, now the next input must be a number. But we're going to ignore any white space that comes in front of that number. So the white space that's in front of the 12 here gets thrown away, and then the 12 gets put into the variable. But for these other examples where the space came first in front of the comma, then it doesn't match the format. The format says the very next character after the number must be a comma. But it's not. It's a space. And so it gives up. The scanf is really kind of stupid and it's kind of brittle. But there is a way to get it to accept all three of these. To allow the space both before and after the comma, or not at all. And what you can do there is you can put a space in front of the comma. So that works with no spaces. It works with spaces around the comma. It works with no space in front of the comma, but one after. And it works with a space in front of the comma, but not after. So what did this do? By including a space in the format specifier, again, we told it, Ignore any white space. So it pulls in the number. Then it says, any amount of white space following that number is going to be ignored. Then we'll see a comma. And then implicitly, any white space after the comma is also going to be ignored because it comes in front of the number. And then it's a number. OK, so we got a number, any number of white spaces, a comma, <clears throat> and then a num another number which could have white spaces in front of it. So there's a little trick you can do to kind of make it work with a, a little bit more flexibility than it otherwise would have.
That was a good question. Very good question. Um, unfortunately, it's just kind of like a little trick you have to know about SCANF and the way it works. And that's why I showed you these diagrams here. Because although it may seem a little mysterious about the way it's working, it's really just following these state diagrams for numbers and white spaces and so forth. Oh, before we, um, I should have finished up with that. So let's see, here's the program. So the way you're going to turn in this program is you're going to download that file to your computer, and then on the assignment page, there will be a button down here. I don't see it because I'm a teacher, but you as a student, there'll be a place for you to upload that file down below the assignment description, and that'll be the way you turn in this file. So how do we turn that, how do we download that? So you can... Go here, you can right click on the file and go to download. And that will download just that one file to your computer and then you can upload it as a submission. I think you can also go file, download and get the same thing. Okay, so highlight the file you want, click on file, download, and then you can submit that one file. That's how we're gonna submit programs at the beginning of the semester. As we work our way towards the end of the semester, we'll learn how to upload those files to a shared uh, file server called a repository, and that's how you'll, you'll upload your files. So you won't, we will no longer submit programs by downloading them to your computer and then uploading them to Canvas. You'll just simply upload them directly to that file repository and then give me the URL of that file, and that's how I'll get it. Okay, so let's move on to the next program. So this one is going to add fractions. The program is called sumfrac.c. And it's going to prompt the user to type in two fractions, separated, each fraction separated by a slash. So like three-fourths would be entered as three slash four. And then it's going to add those two fractions together and display the result as a fraction. Now, C doesn't know anything about fractions. There's no data type built in called fraction. And you're not going to use doubles or floats for this as well. So you need to store away and manipulate the numerators and denominators of each one of those fractions as integers. So you're probably going to need at least four, probably six variables for this program. Two variables to hold the numerator and denominator of the first fraction, and two to hold the numerator and denominator of the second fraction. And you'll probably need two more to hold the numerator and denominator of the result. Now, if you remember from elementary school or wherever you learned about fractions, if you have two fractions with different denominators, this is how you calculate the result. Don't worry about reducing the fraction at this point, right? All we want to do is just do this calculation. Multiply add, and then store away the results for the numerator and denominator. Um, if you want to, there's a little extra piece to this assignment. If you want to, optional extension, you could have it reduce the fraction, and that's going to involve finding the greatest common denominator and then dividing that out. If you don't, whether or not you do that extension, doesn't matter for the assignment. You can do it and you'll get credit for the assignment and you can not do it and you'll still get credit for the assignment. So this is the optional extensions are there for if you feel like I want a little bit more of a challenge, go ahead and do that. Remember, there's no scores on these assignments. You either did it or you didn't do it. So you get to pick how much effort you want to put into this. Okay, so that's that assignment. Let's move on to the next one. Flag. So in this one, you're going to prompt the user to enter the height of a flagpole. In this case, they typed in 8. Now, whenever I'm doing these examples, I'm going to put the user's input in bold. That's just there to make it stand out on this web page so that you can see it easier. There's not an easy way, I'll say it's impossible at this point to put bold in your programs. So 
So don't worry about that. I'm just putting, again, I'm just putting it in bold here so it stands out in the example. So enter the height of the flagpole. We type in eight, and then it's going to print out a flag, and then the whole flagpole needs to be of, of height eight. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines that, core, that make up the whole flag. Three of them are used up by the flag itself, and the remaining five are just the flagpole. So the total height is eight. Make sure that the user types in a flagpole height between three and 14. If it's outside of that range, just display an error message and then don't, then, then just end the, end the program at that point. Remember, main is a function and you can just simply return from main and it will end the program effectively. That's one way to do it. Otherwise, or you could just wrap up the whole program inside of an if else. So if it's within three to 14, go ahead and display the flag. If it's out else, just display an error message and then your program is done. The flag itself is always going to be three rows tall and, uh, three rows tall and five uh, so three rows tall and eight columns wide. So the flag is always exactly the same size. It's always facing to the right. <clears throat> okay. And then there's an optional extension. If the user types in a negative number, display the flag upside down. You're going to turn in the program the same way you did the other ones. You're going to download the file and upload it to Canvas. Okay, and the last program is called Grilling. This is a level up. <clears throat> so this summer I did a lot of cooking on the barbecue grill. They come in different sizes, so let's write a program to draw a picture of a grill. Uh, the grill is a rectangle. The user will supply the width and the height of the grill in that order. Your program will draw a picture of a rectangular grill. Here's one that is 12 wide and 4 tall. So 12 characters wide, 4 rows tall. To draw this picture, use plus signs in the corner. Use vertical bars, also called pipes, that are on the sides, and dashes in the middle. The program will prompt the user for the width and height of the grill separately. The width must be at least 2 and no more than 30. The height must be at least 2 and no more than 12. Anything else would display an error message indicating what went wrong, a gentle reminder to the user of the valid ones, and then exit the program immediately. If the width and height are valid, the program draws the grill and then exits. Here's what a run with erroneous input could look like. So you typed in 18 and 14, and you say the grill height is too high. Width must be 2 to 30, and the height must be 2 to 12. Okay, so study the rubric here. I'll be using it to evaluate your programs. We're looking for, does the program compile and run and produce the correct output? And is the source code readable? So are, are variable names well chosen? Is it well formatted? Um, are there comments? indicating the purposes of the various parts of the code. Um, so does it look nice? Now again, this rubric here is not a score. I'm just simply going to be looking at these two things when I evaluate it. When I, when I evaluate it. So just a, a little Reminder, if you want to count from 1 to 10, what would your loop look like? If you were to write a for loop, what do the pieces of the for loop look like? It would count from, uh, not from 10 to 1, 1 to 10. How would you count from 10 to 1? And then the second one, how would you count from one to a hundred, but by twos. So put those in the chat. 
How would you do the first one that counts from 10 to 1? And how would you do the second one that counts from 1 to 100 but by 2s? Let me take a look at what you wrote here, Steve. So you have for int i equals 10, good. And then i is greater than 0. So as long as it's greater than 0, keep doing the loop. And then i minus minus, that's perfect. For the condition, you could have also written i is greater than or uh, equal to 1. That'll work as well. How about the second one? Count from 1 to 100, but by 2s. So it's going to go 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and so forth. Int i equals 1. That's good. And then we have i is less than or equal to 100. And then i plus equals 2. Very good. So this will increment i by 2's as it goes. You might need those loops for your programs that you're writing this week. Okay. What questions do you have for me? Well, here's what I want to leave you with today. I've made reference a couple of times to like the fact that C as a language has been around for a very long time the early 1970s. And what was computing like back in the 1970s? Well, actually, I don't know what it was like. I mean, I've seen pictures of what it was like in the 1970s, but I was far too young back then to have kind of any real, I mean, I, I never really, I didn't really touch a computer myself until about 1980, tells you how old I am. Um, and by then, the personal computer was out um, it wasn't the ones that you would recognize today. It wasn't like, you know, a, a Mac or a Windows machine, but they were older computers. But that was the first ones I touched back in 1980. But those were personal computers. What were business computers like? Well, business computers were things like the Digital Equipment Corporation VAX computers. And uh, I mean, they, they weren't the big giant room, room sized ones that you've probably seen from the World War II era that consumed almost as much electricity as a small city. No, these were now smaller. They were, I guess we would call mini computers. They weren't desktop sized, but they could you could certainly fit several of them in a, in a large machine room. But here's what they looked like. So on the right hand side here, I've got a picture showing you the scale of these things. Here is a, um, a box. It's probably about this high on the picture, and here's a, you know a couple of people around, so you can see how big they are. They're about they're about the size of like a washing machine or a small refrigerator. And so we've got one here, and then next to it would be auxiliary units like for storage and um, networking, input and output, and then in the front we've got what are called teletypes. Teletypes are essentially just a keyboard connected to a printer, but not the kind of printer that you see today with their inkjet printers. These are old style printers that are not much different from typewriters. Typewriters basically had a piece of paper that was 
held up against uh, what's called a platen, and then it had hammers that came and struck the paper. Each one of those hammers had a different letter on it. So there would be um, 50 or 60 hammers inside of a, a, a typewriter or a teletype, each one of them with a different letter on it. And then if you wanted to print the letter A, this hammer would come up and strike the paper. There'd be a ribbon, a fabric ribbon that held some ink. And so it would be paper, uh, ribbon, and then this hammer, which would come and hit it. And it would physically imprint the letter A on that piece of paper. And then if you wanted to print um, you know, a dash or something like that, there'd be a different hammer that had that character on it. And it would come up and it would strike the ribbon and uh, leave the imprint of the dash on the piece of paper. So they were, as you can imagine, the sound of these hammers hitting this piece of paper uh, with this hard rubber platen behind it as a backing were kind of noisy. You know, click, 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 click. They're kind of noisy. In fact, let me see if I can find a video of it. Can you hear that okay? No, of course. All the bits get into the famous bit bucket. That's where the expression comes from. The one that comes from this thing. Let me back up a bit. You see them loading some paper into it. Before electronic, it is also a mass storage device. Over the phone on the right uh, side. I, I guess you, you get an idea about how and also punch kind of noisy and slow they are. And what this video is not showing you is input. But you can see that it's got a, a typewriter keyboard on it, and you would just type on the keys, and that would it would imprint on the paper, and it would send bits over a wire to the computer. Were you, able, were you able to see that? Oh, it got, it got kind of frozen. That's weird. Let me, let me do that again. I don't know why the, the screen froze like that. Let me back up a bit. Demo. Line. So here I am sending an ASCII message pre-recorded on the HP terminal magnetic cartridge to the teletype. I have the teletype set up to print the message and also punch it on the tape. Okay, so they're, they're noisy, they're slow, um, but that's how you got input and output back in the 1970s through these teletypes. And it, it, by the 1980s or so, they were replaced by video terminals, which still had the keyboard, but now the typewriter portion of it was replaced by a video screen. You can see it in the background of this video. There's one of these video uh, terminals in the background. Um, but you can see it's still got the typewriter here, um, but it's been re the output has been replaced by a screen. So if you were to open up one of these computers, this is what you would see. This is a Digital Equipment Corporation VAX 11750, which was actually a computer that I got to use when I was in college in the 1980s and early 1990s. Um, those computers were not ones that you could physically touch. They were inside of a, you know, air-conditioned, ventilated computer room. And then we students got access to them through the terminals, through the video terminals. And let me, um, well, let me show you this here. So if I was to open up one of those VAX computers, this is what you'd see inside. You'd see you know, like a power supply over on the left-hand side, and then all these cards, these large circuit boards. 
<clears throat> and uh, you know, one of these circuit boards would hold like the processor along with its auxiliary components. And then there are more boards in here for the memory of the computer and disk drive controllers would be another board. Uh, network controllers would be another board. So this basically this, this computer is just a box with a back plane and a bunch of connectors for putting in slotted cards. If you look inside of a today's PC, you still see the you still see the main board that has the processor on it and the RAM, but you also got those slots where you can do things like plug in your your video card and more USB ports. Right? Same kind of idea, but in this case, the processor itself is also on a card and the memory is also on its cards. So the back plane is really just a, a plain circuit board with a bunch of slot connectors and then traces going in between the slot connectors. The back plane doesn't do anything more than just provide power and then a bus for moving data back and forth. <clears throat> so scattered around our university campus were computer rooms, rooms where you could go in and sit down in front of a video terminal, this is what I used, or back in the 1970s it would have been these teletypes. And so you'd have a room full of maybe a dozen or so of these teletypes or in my case, a couple of dozen of these video terminals, because the video terminals are quieter, so you can put more of them in a room, uh, and they're smaller. <clears throat> but then how do you get the data from the computer to the teletype? Now, if you look on the back of your desktop PC, there's probably one or two serial ports on the back. It's a nine-pin D-shaped connector, and right above it is probably like 101010 that kind of lets you know this is a serial port. And what would you connect to that these days? Well, you might connect an old style modem. If you remember your parent, maybe you still have memory of dial-up internet, right? You'd have this little box that was either in the computer or sitting next to the computer that had lights on it. And then you would click on a button on your computer and then that modem would go to work and make these screeching noises. And that was the sound of the individual bits being sent over the telephone wire to the, the internet service provider. But before that, there were just these teletypes or video terminals sitting in a room and they had to be connected to the main computer somehow. So on the back of the main computer would be like a, a, a cable running to one of these things, and these are called um, uh, terminal servers. They're basically just a box with a whole bunch of serial ports on the back. There are two kinds of serial ports. There's the nine pin serial port that you're used to from your PC, but there are also these older style 25 pin serial ports. Um, you know, of these 25 pins these days, only nine of them are actually used, actually fewer than that, about five of them are actually used to do serial communications. All you need is a pin for power, a pin for ground, so two pins for power, and then you need a transmit and a receive uh, wire, and then you need one other wire for control signals to kind of just let you know that, that bits are coming and going or they're not coming and going. Um, so you only need five or six actual wires to do serial communications, but they're still held in these 25-pin connectors. So you've got this terminal server, and then you can see out of it are coming all of these serial cables. And each one of these terminal servers could have like 20 or 40 serial connectors on it, and all of these would then run over to teletypes or video terminals. So when your program outputs a string on the screen, it doesn't send that whole string all at once. It sends it one character at a time. So if your program says printf hello, it sends it as h e L, L, O. Okay, so that H starts heading down out towards the terminal server. The terminal server's job is to figure out which actual terminal it should send those characters to. So the bits for that H, which are just ones and zeros or ons and offs, get sent out of the serial port and they go down this wire and they might travel hundreds of feet 
or hundreds of meters to a different part of the university, maybe a different building entirely. So you can imagine there's these bundles, bundles of serial cables running, fanning out across the campus. They're, uh, they're probably still there these, <laughs> to this day, probably buried underground in large conduits uh, between the buildings. <clears throat> so that H then gets sent out across the wire. It goes to the teletype and, and, or the video terminal. And there it is. If you're using a teletype, the hammer comes up, strikes that yellow H against the paper, and now it is a fixed character that can't be changed. And although we still don't use these mechanical teletypes anymore, uh, operating systems like Linux and Mac OS still assume that that's how devices are connected to the computer. To this day, the computer doesn't know whether there is a nice fancy uh, MacBook Pro or Windows laptop or an old mechanical teletype connected to the computer doing input and output. To it, it's just the same thing. It's just a device that accepts bits and it puts it on some kind of output device. Okay, so when you print out the word hello, that H goes down the wire and then it goes to the teletype and the teletype puts it on the paper and now it's done with the H. Now here comes the E, right? So the E comes down next. The E is sent to the terminal server. The E is sent down the wire. So the E comes next, right? Behind the H. And then it goes to the teletype and it's committed to paper. Right? And then this, the rest of the string goes the same way. The two L's go down and then the O goes down. Okay? And then they go over to the teletype. So as far as the computer is concerned, as soon as it sends out each one of those letters, it can never get them back. Okay? It's kind of like, again, pushing water down a, a hose, right? You push water down one end of the hose and it flows out the other end and you're never getting that water back. So the computer still works with input and output devices the same way. When you print something to the screen, it's now gone as far as your computer, your program is concerned. You can't get it back. You can't go and ask the screen what letter was on the paper or you can't go and ask the screen, what letter is on the screen? You can't ask the teletype, what letter did I print five minutes ago? There's no way for it to go and like look at the paper. It's just a computer. I mean, these days, of course, you might attach a camera to it and it might use some character recognition, but the computer doesn't do that by default, right? The, once the, the character goes out, it's gone. And that's a, a huge like a conception that some beginning programmers have is that there's really no difference between printing something and returning something in your program. If I say return H in my program, is that the same as print H? And it's not. The print H goes to your screen or to a teletype, and then it's gone. If you say return H out of a function, well, then it just gets returned to another function, and it's still in the computer's memory, and you can still do something with it. Okay, so what happens if I go the reverse direction? What happens if I type one of the keys over here? Well, the bits for what I type, you know, let's say it's my name. If I type a B, then that B goes that direction. It goes into the terminal server. It goes up this bundle of cables into the computer. And now the B is there, but as far as my terminal is concerned, that B is gone. I can't, my terminal can't get to it. I can't ask my terminal, what character did I just send? It's gone. It's now in the computer. It's been sent over the wire to that other computer. Okay? So the reason why I'm doing that is because when you're talking about something like, um, uh, uh, yeah, when you're doing print in your program, it prints out those characters one character at a time, and then once they're gone down the wire to your computer, where you see them on your screen, your program can't get them back. They've been flushed away. One of the questions I sometimes ask is, if my function only prints things out, maybe it does a computation too, um, why is it declared to be void? What does that void mean? I mean obviously, I'm, I'm putting something on the screen, so what, what does the void there mean, right? Because I'm, I'm doing something. 
Uh, and the answer there is you're not returning something to another function in your program. You're just printing things out. And then once you print them out, they're gone. And so there's no way to get them back. And that's why those functions are void. Now, having grown up in that computing environment, that makes perfect sense to me. But I can see, I can totally understand how somebody growing up in the 2000s might have a different concept of, of what printing something out means, right? We don't necessarily print things out to printers so much anymore. We print them out, and when we print them out, it just goes to a screen where they're just pixels turning on and off. Um, and you have to realize that although you've got a nice fancy computer on your end, as far as the underlying operating system on the other end is concerned, you just have a dumb mechanical teletype. And there's no way to get that output back, as far as your program goes. Okay, so that's my little history lesson for today. I hope to bring up more of those history lessons because I think they're fascinating. They're, they're a way for me to, in some ways, relive some of my past, but also to give you a little bit more of an insight about why things are set up the way they are in computers. Um, here, here's one question that sometimes comes up when you're doing, this has nothing to do with C programming, but it has to do with like programming in general. Um, if you do, like some, I'm looking for a piece of paper I can use. Oh, here's one. Yeah, it's just a piece of paper. So if you do some graphics work, and you know there's a coordinate system set up on your screen, and coming from an algebra or a geometry class, you learn that if you have a coordinate system, the, uh, the origin for that coordinate is down in the lower left-hand corner. And then it seems weird that on a computer screen, the coordinate origin is in the upper left-hand corner. And that really throws some students, right? It, it really kind of disorients them because, but, but really it's just basically the y-axis is just pointing down instead of up. So that's the only thing that's flipped. The x still works the same way. But why is that? Why isn't the quarter system, coordinate system uh, with an origin in the top left. Well, it goes back to the old teletype days. If you were to hold up a piece of paper and you would say, look on line five, you know, where would you count from? It, well, you'd count from the top, wouldn't you? You'd count down by five. You wouldn't count up by five. That seems weird. So that's, that's where that comes from, is that it comes from a piece of paper, which comes from the old teletype days. Once you explain that to people, they go, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Why didn't they tell us that to begin with? Well, um, I think that's about all for today. Does that leave you with any questions for me? Okay, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with this. When you turn in your programs, I will take a look at them. Now for these beginning programs, they're really simple. They either pretty much just work or don't work. There's no score. I don't know if, remember if I had a chance to talk to you about this, but I want you to, to get as much as you can out of this class. And you probably want it, it, it too. You're, you're here because you want to go on to another institution and earn your bachelor's degree or maybe a master's or PhD in computer science, or you want to go out in industry. And you want to become a programmer. That means, you know, you need to be good at it. You're up against all the other programmers that are out there. So I want you to get as much as you can out of this course. I don't want you to stress about things like points. That's a huge stress, I think, for some students. Like, what did I earn on that assignment? Am I going to get a 10? Is it a 9.5? Um, over the years, I've like really come to dread actually grading assignments because I look at a program, I go, well, you know what? That program's like pretty close. It's it, you know, it's got a little rough edges, but it's pretty close. It gets all the main concepts down. There's just a couple of little problems with it. So, what score do I give it? Do I give it like a 10? Do I give it a 9.5, a 9, an 8.5, how much do I deduct for that minor little error? That's what I really didn't like because now I had to like 
give it a point score, and then justify it. I had to write a little paragraph about why I deducted half a point or a point. And, and um, sometimes those little, little um, justifications were pretty short and terse, like, uh, um, you know, poor indentation, and half a point off, right? And then when you get that score as a student, you go like, oh, well, I got a 9.5 on that assignment. I guess that's good enough. I'm moving on. And at that point, in your mind, the assignment's done. And I might have written some feedback like, hey, you know, next time work on naming your variables better or, um, you know, work, look at this one edge case for your condition where it doesn't handle that particular condition correctly. Look at the, you know, make sure you handle that next time. I'm lucky if you actually paid attention to that feedback, honestly, um, because you got the score and now the assignment's done. And, and sort of internally you feel like, well, there's nothing I can do about that. That's the score that was handed down and that's it. I don't want you to feel that way. If you go to a, if you're working at, let's say, a restaurant and your manager says, hey, I want you to go clean the tables up. After you get the work done and the manager comes over to inspect your work, does he or she say like, oh, you got an 85% on that? No, it doesn't work like that. You either did the job or you need to go back and finish it. There's no score. It's either done or it's not done, right? And so that's the way I'm going to handle grading in this class. Or I'm not going to call it grading. It's called ungrading, actually. When you turn in a program, I'm going to take a look at it, and you're either done or you're not done. It's either done good enough, and I'll give you a complete on it, uh, or it's not done good enough. I'll give you an incomplete, and then I'll give you some feedback. I'll write some comments about what you could do to turn it in again. Um, and uh, if you do all these things, you'll, you'll probably get a complete. So I'll have you go back rework the program, and submit it again. And then we'll just repeat that process until it's either complete or you say, like, I'm not going to get this. And, and that's okay, too. If you get to the point where it's just not going to work and you're busy and you got other things to do and you need to move on, do that, you know. You know, talk, work with me. Say, like, you know, I got 90% of it working. I just can't finish the other 10%. And who knows, maybe I'll just go, okay, it's done. I'll mark it complete. You know, you got the idea. I wish you had gone on and fixed the little problems, but, you know, you got it. So I want to take the stress out of trying to earn a specific point value on a particular assignment and just go for completion. Is it good enough? Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. So that's what you'll get. Is if I leave no comments at all and it's marked as complete, it means it was good enough. You got it done. Move on. Uh, if it's marked complete and I thought there was something outstanding about your program, I'll comment on it. I'll say, hey, good work on that, uh, you know, well, variable naming at this point. Or good work, uh, that's a really unique way to solve that problem. I had not thought about, you know, structuring that loop that way. So if I see something that's really great and worth commenting on, I'll comment on it. And also, if there's something that's, that your program is deficient in, then I'll write comments on that and go back and fix it, turn in it again. There are also no penalties for turning in an assignment late. Because there's no scores on assignments, there can't be any penalties for turning in an assignment late, which means um, there's really no due dates. Although there are due dates on the assignments, those are really there as just a guideline to help you keep on track. We've got 15 more weeks in the semester. There's a lot of programming to do. It's really easy to fall behind, particularly when in your mind you're thinking, there's no due dates. I can just put this off till next week. And then next week you go, you know, I got a physics exam coming up. I'm just going to put it off till next week. And before you know it, it's week 10 and you've done like almost nothing in the course. And that happens to a lot of students, admittedly. That happens to a lot of students. And then you try to cram all the work into the last two weeks. There's a couple of problems with that. One is, it's a lot of work for you. Uh, two is, if you turn in a program that needs additional rework, that's a lot of work for me to look at your programs, give you comments on it that are worth commenting about, and then have you, have you turn in again. So cramming all the stuff into the last two weeks or one week is just not worth it. I won't be able to give you the kind of feedback that would benefit you, and you just got a lot of work to do. So I want you to, even though there are no hard and fast due dates, keep up with the work. It's really important because there's a lot of work to do. Um, I'm going to try to keep you on schedule by periodically having you fill out like a little check-in. Like, how many assignments have you gotten done? 
Um, do you need additional help on any of these? You know, just something to like keep you going. And and those check-ins, I'm gonna you know have deadlines on those because if I give you a check-in and you don't do the check-in until week number twelve, well then what what point was that? So over the course of the semester, you're gonna build up like this portfolio of work that you've done, and at the very end of the semester. We'll meet one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom for five or ten minutes and we'll go over that portfolio and uh, we'll arrive at a consensus about what your grade is going to be. I'm going to ask you, what grade do you think you got in this course based upon this criteria? I'll give you a table that shows you the criteria. And then um, I'm going to say, well, this is what I think your grade should be. And then we'll work together on arriving at a consensus. I'll tell you, 80% of the time, we arrive at the same consensus and then there's no discussion, right? We both thought well, you got an A and then that's it. So I think this grading system might seem unusual and it might seem a little dis disorienting at first, but I think you're going to like it because there's going to be a lot less stress about points and more focus on doing better and getting better as a programmer over the course of the semester. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's basically it. Remember, you need to answer the discussion questions to introduce yourself and also read that essay about the case against grades, which is all about this ungrading stuff, and then respond to those two discussion prompts by Friday, and then also respond to two of your classmates by Monday. Anything else? I'm, I'm looking now at the comments here. Steve said, I use a teletype exactly like that. It's referring to the teletype I had about on the screen about 15 minutes ago. Uh, when I worked at the South San Francisco Public Library in 1979, it wasn't connected to a computer. It printed out on a teletype at a different library. Oh, so you type on one teletype, and that would send the characters over to another teletype on the other end, and it would just print out what you typed. Right, so it's kind it of like... kind of the late 70s version of a fax. Or a late 70s version of uh, what we would call like instant messaging, right? Yeah. yeah. You type, and then it just appears on the other person's screen, or in this case, piece of paper. Which means that they got to see, like, all of your mistakes. <laughs> right? Uh, the, the teletype, some teletypes were sent up, set up so that you would type the whole line, and then when you press enter, it would then send all the characters for that line kind of all at once. Or they could be set up so that every key you press on this teletype results in a character being uh, printed on that teletype in real time. So you type a key here, and then it appears over there. And then you type a key here, and it appears over there. And those ones are kind of nerve-wracking because then they can see like all the mistakes you make. What we usually did was we would punch it to the tape. Mm. And if you made a mistake, you could go back and hit delete, and it would punch all the holes there across the tape, which was a delete character. Mm -hmm. And then you'd play it back, connect it to the other teletype, so they wouldn't see your mistakes. But ah. every mistake still took time. So if you hit 10 wrong characters, it would still send 10 delete characters. So it would take that much time. Yeah. But it wouldn't print out on the other teletype. Yep. Oh, those are the days, huh? Yep. Um, another qu uh, question here. Is it possible to use TCP or UDP or any of network sockets to WebSocket? Oh, that's a question that's not for this right now. So that's something I'll answer right now. That's like way in the, towards the end of the semester. Um, and some comments about, you like the, like the analogy about the barrel and the water as far as dripping out the characters for, for scanf. Okay. Well, without any further questions, I think um, it'll basically be it. We're ending a little bit early, but that's fine. So normally on, on Wednesdays, we'll have our lecture portion during the first 90 minutes or so. And then we'll have what would usually be what's called the lab portion. And that'll be where I introduce the program. And then sometimes I just wait for some questions or I go in and do like other stuff like you just saw with the teletypes things. Go and talk about something else. 
So hopefully that is a good start to the semester that you're able to write these first programs, get them. Uh, the earlier you can get them in, the earlier I can look at them and the earlier I can get them back to you, uh, particularly if there's uh, work that needs to be redone on the program. So I would suggest if you are writing a program and you get stuck somewhere like through the program, you go like, hey man, I just, I just can't get any further. Turn it in as you've got with a little comment that says like, hey, I, I, it's not all running. Could you at least let me know if I, I'm on the right track or um, how am I doing so far? And then I can give you feedback on that, right? So I don't, I don't want this to be like, I give you the assignment, you go off for a couple of days, and then you turn something in when you're all done. If you really get stuck, turn in your half complete program, I'll take a look at it and give you some feedback. And that'll help you move, make some progress on the program. Um, I may not be able to get back to you right, right away, but at least I can get back to you within a day or so. Um, I'm working on getting some tutors and assistants to help out. We don't have those hired yet, um, but we're working on that. And then once we do get them hired, they'll be available on like weekends and night times and during the day to be able to give you some, you know, quick help on your programs. They can look at your programs, do screen sharing with them, and then they can help you out with uh, writing the programs. But we're working on hiring those, those, those students right now. Okay, so that's it for today. If you have any other questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you on uh, Monday. Okay, everyone, take care. Have a good, good weekend. Bye-bye. Record. And YouTube folks, hey, good discussion there. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get back to you right away on some of those questions, but um, it looks like some others of you did a good job of answering questions like what's better, C or C++? And what we didn't get to, what's the difference between a virtual machine and a bytecode interpreter? So a virtual machine is a computer program that essentially simulates the in, an entire computer system, including processor, memory, and peripherals. So as far as the programs running on top of a virtual, mean or, or, or a virtual machine are concerned, they're looking at what looks like an actual piece of hardware. They can't, the, the program being just ones and zeros, can't tell the difference between actual hardware and a simulation of hardware. But a bytecode interpreter is just a program that just runs programs. So it's just simply a, um, it's, it, I call it a virtual machine because it does, in a sense, simulate an entire computer, but the computer is not a real computer in any stretch of the imagination. It's a generic computer that has like some basic peripherals and that's it. So a bytecode computer, a uh, bytecode interpreter is just looking at the, the compiled program and then executing the bytes as it sees them. Um, but these programs can't like go and inspect the hardware and go like, what hardware do I have out there? Do I have a, do I have a, um, a disk drive? Do I have a, a screen? Because it's not going to see those things. I, I guess that wasn't really a satisfactory answer, but really a bytecode computer, pro, a bytecode interpreter is just a program that just simply runs another program. And a virtual machine is a program that simulates the hardware of an entire other computer. So a virtual machine is a lot more complex than a bytecode interpreter. Hopefully one day you'll take a course in like programming language design or compiler design. You'll get a much better picture of all that. It's really hard to describe at a beginner's level the difference between them. Okay. Um, I also have to apologize for something. There were some places where I wanted to be on camera, but I was showing my iPad or my laptop. Um, or there were places where I was showing my laptop, but or I was showing my camera, but I should have been showing something else. And so I'm. I, because the YouTube stream and the Zoom stream are different, I'm working on getting those two synchronized so that each participant sees the same thing. And I quite haven't got them done. So I, I realized for the past half an hour when I was talking to my Zoom people, it was just my face on the screen, but you were just seeing my, my iPad with my little picture in the corner. And that was not intended. It was supposed to be my whole face, but it wasn't. Um, and so I have to work on that. So uh, hopefully by next week, I'll have that taken care of. All right. 
Well, that's it. I will uh, bid you all a farewell and have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye.